I'm Andrew Bennett, the director of the Religious Freedom Institute's North America Action Team. The mission of RFI is to achieve broad acceptance of religious liberty as a fundamental human right, the cornerstone of a successful society, and a source of national and international security. We put this mission into practice in the United States and around the world through five action teams and our Center for Religious Freedom, Education. Today, I'll be discussing the questions of religious freedom as I interview Dr. Scott Redd, the president of Reformed Theological Seminary. Scott, welcome. It's great to have you uh, with us today. It's great to be here, Andrew. Um, so, Scott, you're the president of Reformed Theological Seminary in the United States and an Old Testament scholar. Mm -hmm. And so tell me a little bit about Reformed Theological Seminary, its mandate, and a little bit about your research interests. No, oh, thanks for asking. Uh, we RTS Reform Theological Seminary is really a it, it's a, about a sixty year fifty to sixty year long project, um, really aimed towards teaching pastors and other church leaders, whether they be ordained or unordained, in a, a Protestant Reformed theology of Scripture and what Scripture says. Um, for how we're to live our lives, where we work, where we live, where we play. There's, there's a big view of, of the kingdom of God at RTS. And so uh, coming out of that confessional movement, um, we, we really do focus on having a, a, a strong, robust, reformed tradition, um, and at the same time being practically minded, applying this into a variety of different areas and locales in life. Um, which, you know, for our campus, Reformed Theological Seminary in Washington, D.C., kind of fittingly, because we're in the nation's capital, uh, has led us to start what's called the Institute of Theology and Public Life, which is a, an endeavor to really engage with people who are involved in downstream vocations, whether that's education or um, health care, legislation, national security, um, and, and to engage their own robust system of theological uh, understanding and engage that with what's happening in these kind of public square um, vocations and how to think about that. So we have a lot of people coming through the program who actually aren't going into pastoral ministry, but are just going back out into the world to apply what they've learned in a way that benefits not only themselves and the church, but actually, actually their neighbor and their, their fellow citizens. So RTSDC is a part of a, a 10 year, a 10 rather 10 year campus um, uh, school. So we're in Atlanta, Dallas, Orlando, Houston, New York City, Jackson, Mississippi, Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, we're really all over the place. So uh, that's that's RTS in a nutshell. And I see my job there really as trying to gather together theologians, philosophers, policy thinkers together in a place where we can think in a, in a deep and historically informed way about a lot of the issues that are facing uh, not only the church in the United States, but the church around the world. Now, do you find, sort of coming out, that, out of that Reformed theological uh, perspective, that there's a natural inclination within the Reformed tradition towards uh, engaging the public square? Has that shifted over time? What's your sense of that in the U.S. today? Yeah, it's a good question. You know, in terms of Reformed communities in the United States today, um, there's a variety of different parties, as there are in a lot of different religious communities. Um, you'll find those who are more engaged in public policy or public square discussions and those who are probably more um, you know, pulling back out of that public dialogue. Uh, I think in, the, in terms of historical belief and historical application of the reform tradition, we have a pretty strong, um, strong base in our historical theology that looks towards how do we apply this into the public square? I mean, Abraham Kuyper, uh, you know, who sure. prime minister of, of Amsterdam and, or excuse me, of the Netherlands and uh, uh, well-known theologian is coming out of the reform tradition. John Calvin, of course, had a very far reaching expansive view of, of the implications of theology for all of life. So we're trying to lay hold of that, not only the continental tradition, uh, like Calvin and Kuiper, but also where we see that showing up in the English Reformation and other Reformations around the world. So in today's day and age, there is a bit of a debate as to how we're supposed to be engaging in the public square. And yet, I don't think there's a debate as to whether or not we're supposed to be engaging. I mean, the, the scriptures seem to be 
um, pretty clear in the in the public um, the public momentum of the gospel proclamation, and and I think most Reformed Christians understand that. Why don't we explore that a bit? Because that's a really interesting point. Because obviously, at the core of engaging the public square is this question of religious liberty and religious right. freedom. What does that look like? Right. Um, so you recently wrote a piece that came to our attention at the RFI where you discuss religious liberty in the context of the biblical tradition, kind of looking through that that prism of the biblical tradition and biblical theology. So what do you think uh, the biblical tradition can tell us today, uh, or can, how can it speak to us today about religious liberty? Uh, that, that, that's a good question. It's one that was has been fascinating me for a while. Um, I was approached by the Institute of uh, Faith, Work, and Economics to contribute to a volume that came out in the fall um, developing, I mean, the, the, my marching orders were to develop a biblical theology, because of course that's my area, a biblical theology of religious freedom. And, and as I was delving into the question, um, I found that actually not a lot of people have been writing on a biblical theology, as it were. And, and in reform circles, that typically means a, a redemptive historical understanding of religious freedom. There's been a lot of historical theology uh, an inquiry that's been done on that question, but not as much on the biblical side. So mm. I delved into it. And obviously in, in scriptures here, we have an ancient text in the Old Testament and, and a classical text, as it were, in the New Testament, um, both coming out of contexts where religious liberty per se, as we articulate the question today, is, is not being explicitly addressed in much of the biblical text. And yet, what I try to argue is that the biblical text assumes uh, a religious liberty that actually is innate and should be innate to every human being. And that's assumed in the doctrines that are explicitly taught. You know, for instance, this idea of being made in the image of God, um, that, that we are vice regents established under God, who is creator King to go out and fill the earth and subdue it. That bestows a certain, um, a certain agency on, on the human, the human believer, as it were. And it's interesting that even after the fall, um, we see that statement to, to form and fill the earth as images of God reiterated to Noah. So, so we can't say, oh, well, that was just for, you know, some kind of pre-fall theology or something like that, but that this is actually something that's articulated to all of humanity. Right. And so looked at a couple of these other doctrines. There's there's the idea of the image of God that we are made as, as sort of vice kings to serve under God in, um, in in just human endeavor around the world. There's the reality of God's sovereignty. Uh, I, I think most restrictions on religious liberty have this kind of pernicious underlying assumption that if humans don't squash out unbelief, then, then God's will won't be enacted on the earth or something along those lines. Um, and yet in the biblical Christian tradition, we have this high view of God's kingship, right? God's divine kingship over the universe, and that he himself is bringing history to his just ends. And therefore, as humans, it's not our job, as it were, um, to, to restrict or constrain um, religious belief or, you know, uh, religious expression because of some kind of fear about God's will being enacted. Um, those are kind of deep background doctrines. And I, and I had one more that I think is incredibly important in both the Old and the New Testaments, and that is this idea of sincere faith. Mm -hmm. You know, the assumption in the Old Testament that if you believe outwardly, but it's been somehow forced upon you or compelled, or is even just hypocritical in any way, but you don't internally believe, it's not something that you actually yourself, a belief that you actually yourself hold, then that is somehow not only a, a, a lesser kind of faith, it's actually an unfavorable kind of faith. Um, you know, the, the common agrarian metaphor in the Old Testament of a tree being planted by a stream of water, you know, the assumption is that someone who believes in God is like this tree that's planted by a stream of water. Their life comes from the stream, right? And it's juxtaposed from those who aren't planted by a stream of water. The assumption being that this is an internal heart thing, this faith that we're talking about, both in the old and in the new. And of course, in the New Testament, uh, sincerity and personal faith is uh, is forefronted um, throughout all over the place. I mean, the whole assumption of the Great Commission of Jesus is that people can choose or not choose 
to believe. So I tried to develop some of these doctrines, this idea both in the old and the new, that religious liberty is something that is assumed as well as encouraged throughout the biblical text. And it's not, it's not an ancillary doctrine, but it's actually one of those basic undergirding doctrines of biblical theology. And something that's really bound up in the in the nature of the human person, and this is something that we we talk a lot about at the RFI, sort of this anthropological understanding of religious liberty. Right. That as a human person, you have these freedoms, and these these fundamental freedoms, including religious freedom, is really rooted in your very personhood. And so, uh, hence our slogan, "Religious freedom for everyone, everywhere." It's really pointing to that human reality. Right. But it seems that, that sometimes we forget this. And uh, getting back to your point about trying to uh, live fully in the public square um, as people uh, with, with religious beliefs, mm -hmm. there seems to be a, a bit of an amnesia at times uh, in our own um, you know, North American society, whether we're in the United States or up in Canada where I am. So I'd like to explore that a little bit with you. Sure. Um, because religious freedom, uh, certainly right back to the time of the founders, has been seen as fundamental to American democracy and both in terms of free exercise and also religion and its non-established character in the United States. Right. So, you know, to what extent, given the work that you're doing um, there in, in DC uh, in Virginia, you know, to what extent do you believe that this free exercise character of religious freedom is really appreciated by most citizens these days? Yeah, I think it's something that is probably like a lot of our basic political values, probably something that is assumed or leaned upon without uh, much deliberate reflection. Um, and I think that's a dangerous situation to be in because you can lose those things that you're not deliberately reflecting on and, and recognizing and acknowledging they, they can become blind spots. I personally think the reason why we have to be talking about religious freedom in the way that RFI is, and you all have been doing great work in this regard, and I'm thrilled to be a part of it. Um, I think that people can become, particularly as the world around them seems more topsy-turvy. And of course, we I don't know that in my lifetime, we've lived in a more topsy-turvy phase than we are right now. But not just in these big you know, pandemic or 9-11 type situations, but just in the sort of cultural disorientation that so many are feeling and have felt, particularly in the West, there's this sense, if you're on the more conservative side, there's the, maybe a sense that we've been losing some of our, you know, some of the values that made us great. And, and if you're on maybe a more liberal side, you might feel as if we're moving in terms of some positive directions, and yet things definitely aren't where you would want them to be. But in either case, you can have this kind of disorientation, this, this sense that things are out of control. And I think that can push us to an unhealthy desire to control um, you know, belief system, religious expression and exercise. If we're not thinking about religious exercise and religious liberty as something that is an innate human right. Um, and so I, I find that to be a place where I think there's, there's some danger and why we need to be talking about the importance of religious liberty not only in the West, but sort of across the board as a human right, a global human right, and recognizing it as such. I think people are, are pretty well exercised in, in talking about um, maybe the right to privacy or, or the right to free speech, and yet not very exercised in thinking about the idea of expression and exercise of religion. I think it's crucial that we highlight this and keep this in the front of the conversation in the years ahead. Well, just building upon that and, and this whole question of free exercise, um, in the American context, do you find, based on your experience but as an academic, as a teacher, do you find that there is the right type of formation underway that uh, in terms of civics, in terms of forming people as citizens, that gives them um, a sense of what free exercise looks like in practice? Yeah. Um, do you see that there are challenges in that, in that regard? Yeah, there are definitely challenges. I mean, I can only speak... Um, you know, from I can speak speak more with more expertise from my own context in a Reformed Protestant uh, tradition. I'm a part of the Washington Theological Consortium here in the United in the Washington D.C. area as well, which involves a lot of other traditions and theological schools from other traditions. So we talk about this kind of thing a good bit. Um, I do think there's a challenge there because I think, generally speaking, 
when we talk about public theology, at least in Protestant Christian circles, uh, the idea of a public theology is not very well formed, though it should be. We have it in the tradition. It's just unfortunately, I think, been neglected in recent decades. What we typically find more is someone talking about their policy prescriptions on any given set of issues, and then maybe having a couple of proof texts to back that up. But I don't think we've talked about a real thoroughgoing notion of Christian citizenship or Christian uh, political application or social theology in, in a way that's really generative. You know, and what right. I mean by that is you know, a way in which you can approach now new issues that are arising on the horizon because you've got a strong basis. And that's one of the things we've been trying to emphasize uh, at our seminary is even for those people who are going into pastoral ministry, we want them to understand what's at stake and how their own theological commitments inform their, their public theological applications and, and, how, and how they can, how they actually have quite a lot to work with there in terms of, um, in terms of how to think about the issues that are facing not only citizens and Christians in the United States, but around the world, we have a lot to work with that we haven't really mined as well as we should. Now, do you do you find that there are sort of particular pressing challenges in the public square itself uh, to people exercising, you know, that free exercise? Are there? Uh, what are you seeing when people come to you for this type of formation? Um, what's the view from the street, if I can put it that way? How do people see religious liberty being? Uh, actualized in the public square. What are some some challenges there? And then I want to look at maybe some opportunities. But maybe we can start with some challenges that you see right now. Yeah, I, I think. Well, here's here's a more mundane one that's not so um, it's not so political, perhaps, but I think it affects every one of us. There is this sense that the world has become so complicated. Mm. How can we possibly engage in all of these different areas of life? And so people feel overwhelmed. And if you're on social media, you feel doubly or triply overwhelmed um, because of all of the information that's coming at you. And yet at the same time, I think this is, this has got this opposite pressing, uh, you know, pressing tendency in the fact that there's this deep belief in, in the Western tradition, I could say, and in, in, in deeply held in the United States as well, that religion doesn't have a place in the public square. Mm -hmm. and, and you can think about, politicians saying, well, I, I believe this personally, but I don't let that affect my policy commitments or something right. like that. The privatization of religion in a sense. The prob exactly, exactly. Keep it, keep it at home with all of the other topics that we're not supposed to talk about in the public square. And yet I do have a, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty strongly committed to the idea that our policy prescriptions and our policy views are going to be deeply affected by all of those other values that form us as human beings. And that doesn't mean that I need to restrict or constrain someone else on their own religious commitments. And yet at the same time, I, I need to stop with this illusion that there's some kind of objective space that we can all enter into without our preconceived notions and our, our beliefs, our belief systems. And so I think that's something that Christians know inherently. They know that even though they're, even when they're a Christian at home, uh, they don't leave that at the front door when they go out to the public square and yet at the same time, they're not exactly sure what that looks like. And, and, and they probably haven't had very many good role models of late. And I think it helps for us to give them a few. Yeah, I mean, it seems that um, having that idea of a role model where we, can, where we can actually say, you know, look, not just historically at people that have lived out a robust, you know, public religious life. But, you know, who right now is demonstrating that type of that type of life? And I think you're right. I think there are some challenges in terms of uh, those role models. Um, but I think also at the core of it seems to be uh, a fear maybe at times to engage in genuine, uh, let's call it kind of a robust dialogue Amen. where yeah. if, if I if I come into the public square with my religious beliefs and I'm, I'm engaging my fellow citizens, my fellow human beings who don't have either those religious beliefs in particular or don't have religious belief at all, there's going to be some cause for offense and so therefore I retreat back into the private sphere. And what happens then is there's kind of this breakdown in societal dialogue. Um, is that overstating it too much, do you think? No, I don't think so at all. As a matter of fact, this, this fear of, of offense or fear of disagreement 
which of course has this in today's discourse has this matching, um, you know, almost, you know, the low, low bar of outrage, which is an ironic uh, pairing, but this fear of offense and robust dialogue, particularly on the issues that we hold most dear, like the reason for, for life, okay, you know, life, the universe, and everything, you know, as it were, we, we, we have such a difficulty having robust dialogue about those things, partly because of the fear of, one, of not being able to give offense. So I think that as we learn how to be better articulators of our own beliefs, even and especially with people who disagree with us, we're going to have more opportunity to see the value of religious liberty and religious expression in the public square. But I think you're absolutely right. Training up people to disagree charitably and rationally and in a way that that has mutual respect, I think, is an incredible um, incredible gift that needs to be encouraged and cultivated more, not only in educational institutions like the seminary, but really at all levels of society. And so what do you see as some opportunities for that now? I mean, you're now really sort of entrenched in this space with your work at the seminary. So what are you seeing in terms of opportunities that exist? What type of opportunities do you want to create? Uh, tell me a little bit about, about that. Yeah, I, well, that's a good question. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm the father of, of five daughters. So I think I have to say it, it, this begins at the family level. And, one, and to one extent, you know, the family's being able to think in a whole wholehearted way. Now I'm using biblical language again. This is uh, the Shema of Deuteronomy 6, how we are to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, and strength. How do we apply that in our contemporary context? I think that starts in the family. It can happen through discipleship and pedagogy in the family. It can happen at the level of the church. I think churches need to be thinking um, more deliberately and articulating how they can see a fuller expression of the Christian life, not only in the worship that happens on Sunday morning and maybe the, the Bible studies of the community groups during the week, but out there in, in society. Um, so that's one of the reasons why we want to want to bring this into the training of pastors so that pastors can be thinking about these things and learning different approaches and, and, uh, and you know, paradigms for this kind of training. Um, but I really do kind of going back to it, I'm looking to people who are in the public square to give a good representation of what this looks like. There's a, a, a sociologist named James Davison Hunter who wrote a book, To Change the World, which is a sociological application in many ways of this problem from a Christian point of view. And he really articulates the importance of this idea of faithful presence. And I think the idea of Christians being present at different, not only you know, different areas of public life, but in particular, in those, those areas of cultural production, like Washington, D.C., like the universities, like the hospitals now. I mean, hospitals have become a hub now for uh, American society. Having Christians be faithfully present there as Christians, I think, is an important way in which this sort of grand pedagogy can happen at a large scale. Excellent. Well, Scott, you know, we're so excited at the Religious Freedom Institute, and I'm excited as the director of the North American Action Team to have you on board as a senior fellow. Um, we promise not to work you too hard, but uh, we're looking <laughs> forward to continuing this conversation and uh, really seeing um, how we can address some of those challenges, but also see some of those opportunities and, and make some uh, ourselves. So thanks again very much for, uh, for joining me today. Thanks. I'm thrilled to be a part of this, Andrew. Wonderful. We'll talk to you soon. Take care. To learn more about RFI's work to secure religious freedom for everyone everywhere, please visit rfi.org. You can also follow us on social media.